So I'll start um, just with a, a couple of general questions. So the first one is about how you each see the relationship between arts and activism. If anyone wants to start. I, th I think that is prominent. I think I think that is prominent. I think that arts and um, I was going to say arts and intimacy. I don't know where my mind is. I think that <laughs> arts and activism would always happen. Um, like uh, what's it? Global citizen. You know, people always get musicians. I love when it's poets. Not just to be biased, mm. but musicians. It, it gets old, and I think that a lot of their music is uh, opinion based, whereas um, poets tend to often speak, they're much more real, they're much more honest, they're going to say, you know, like about the, the politicians that we talk of, I think they're just going to be much more raw, and what I personally like to do, I'm very, I get very um, activist-like, I mention a lot of news things that some people don't know, I mention certain countries and remote places, uh, remote places, certain charities that people don't know, I love to infotain that way, and I definitely bring out my activ activism in my work, mm -hmm. oh, Ooh, um, that was a really good answer. I don't think I have anything particularly intellectual to say about it. I mean, I do a lot of kind of, um, I do a lot of uh, gigs for like the Labour Party and trade unions, and then I do a lot of like workshops, um, which I guess are sort of political. Like I do a lot of workshops with um, homeless people, with prisons and probation service, with refugees and asylum seekers. Um, I think that um, uh, it's really important that art can be a vehicle for activism. I think if you have a platform and you have um, a, a voice, then you should use that to want to make positive change. And I think, and, and you know, we know um, that art can make real positive change because there are, there are governments around the country that are really terrified of artists and that's why they mm. lock them up and do terrible yeah. things to them. So, yes, that's my answer. Mm. No pressure. Um, I, think, I think you are right. I think there is, you know, art and activism is intrinsically linked. I don't think you can separate them per se. Um, for me, certainly, I, I use art to give myself a voice when I feel like I don't have one, um, particularly my, my Brexit poem um, that I did for you earlier. I, I felt like I had so much anger and so much resentment about so much and, and no platform with which to express it and nothing that I could possibly do because no one cares what I think because I am one of 48%. UK um, and, and I didn't have a outlet for that so I, I use my art and I think many many people do use art as a way to give a voice to people who don't um, and so with that in mind are there any particular um, current issues either based around gender or about anything else that you're kind of thinking about or aware of at the moment um, there's always something on my mind to say, but what I've definitely been writing a lot about, I noticed um, that uh, abuse of women is becoming back into style and fashion. <laughs> and I'm being very serious with that expression because I'm saying, I'm always hearing, oh, this person killed this girlfriend, this person killed their wife. And, that, and it's like, why is this becoming a repetitive thing? Like it's a style, like it's trending. We was meant to be on the decline of that and we've regressed just like how we're regressing it's very irritating to see in the news all about women fighting for uh, equal pay. Mm. Whereas that was not, if you had to go to 2003, 2004, and I know because I've done all my research at that time, it was a beautiful time of empowerment and corporate jobs. There were women owning airlines. There were, you know, the head of WH Smith was a woman, head of Four Seasons was a woman, head of Easy mm. Jet is a woman. You know, so things like that. And now we're fighting that, and now we're fighting to live. And we're fighting, there's a woman in Paris that got a bottle thrown out of her head. Um, a few months ago because a guy hollered at her across the road and she politely ignored him. She didn't just blank him in a rude way. She went, sorry, carried on going. He was like, what? And he threw a bottle at her head. So I write about those things, the violence against women, like they're trying to belittle us to be like, we, you, you had your time, we need to remind you of your position. That's how I personally feel. So I put that in my art and just regular conversation mm -hmm. all the time. Um, I think in terms of, in, my goodness, this is a million issues of the, what an awful, uh, sometimes I feel like what an awful time to be alive in Britain. Uh, but anyway, uh, in terms of gender, I mean, Mark, the big thing that I um, am particularly appalled by in terms of gender at the moment is the abuse of trans women. Um, and, um, and because this seems to have origins um, within the Labour Party as well, so it's kind of something that um, I've, I've learned a lot about 
from within my role of, in the Labour Party and I think one of the most upsetting things about this abuse of trans women is that it's coming from Guardian reading liberal feminists um, and people who in all other walks of life I would call kind of allies and friends and I've been really shocked by some of my closest female friends who have come out um, against trans women so that's kind of something in terms of gender that I'm particularly uh, interested and equally appalled by at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, again, I, I think I mentioned earlier, I, I'm also an, I'm an actor, uh, or an actress, whatever. Um, and for me, a lot of the time when I think about issues with, with women, I can't help but think about issues with women in the arts, um, because those are the ones that, you know, that first and foremost come to me. Um, so things like, as you say, like equal pay, um, you're absolutely right, you know, a few years ago, I had one of those friends, right? Yeah. Um, Okay. Every single member of the cast of Friends was on equal pay. And then you get to, where are we, 2017, 18, when The Crown comes out and you've got Claire Foy, who is the main character of The Crown. She plays Elizabeth, um, the Queen. And she is being paid significantly less than Matt Smith throughout the entirety mm. of that show's being. And, and for me, that just it really pisses me off because there is no hope, there is no point in going backwards. There is nothing to be gained from looking backwards and going, yeah, let's go back before Friends, before all of that, where women had bugger all. Um, so that's something that really gets on me. I'm also watching The Crown at the moment, so that's in my head. Um, and again, actually something that Lauren touched on, is catcalling. Catcalling is my biggest pet peeve. I find that genuinely on a daily basis, whenever I leave the house, I, I get a comment from somebody or something, or someone or somewhere. And I, I'm part of a group called Bossy. I don't know if anyone else yeah. knows Bossy. I know you do, I know you do. Um, there's a group on Bossy, on, on Facebook, sorry, called Bossy, and it's for women in the arts. And I saw somebody post on Bossy, not that long ago, I don't know if anyone else saw it, saying, I'm just doing some research for something. How many times a day or a week or whatever do you think you are catcalled on, on average? And the amount of women I saw typing almost daily. And I thought, yeah, me too. And uh, that, yeah, that is something that's always in my head because you shouldn't have to feel like you can't just leave the house wearing whatever you want to wear or going wherever you want to go. At any hour. At any point, yeah. It doesn't, doesn't have to be evening. Like, I mean, it's been one o'clock in the afternoon and somebody has been like, oh, you're going to look yourself up with those, love. And I'm like, I'm just late. Um, and yeah, it, that's something that really bothers me. So those are the things that are in my head at the moment. Can I make one more? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I also wanted to say with, with Jennifer Lawrence, it's Jennifer Lawrence, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, she was, you know, you hear her name all the damn time. She was the highest paid, what, two years in a row or something like that, and got two Oscars at, at the beginning of her career, for goodness sakes. So this is an Oscar, she's the highest paid, and yet she was the lowest paid for the film. Um, she got the lowest percentage, I should say, for the film Hustle. I think it's Hustle. American Hustle. American Hustle. Yeah, with Bradley Cooper and very familiar faces, but she mm. was the it girl at the time. She was the one bringing in audiences mm. and they couldn't afford, well, this is how the film industry works. I know because I work in film. They, um, if they can't afford to pay you, they offer you a percentage. So they had all these headliners and offered them a percentage. They offered the men 9%. I think she only took 2%. Yeah, exactly. And when I heard that, I was like, you idiot. But then she said in an interview, I wish I would have said nine. But the thing is, it's not that she didn't feel comfortable that you're intimidated you feel like do i have the right to do that and besides the fact that she's inexperienced mm. she's the bigger player with bigger films but that's um but on a good note what i do want to say is the hope um in as an actress um and anyone in arts or, or regardless i'm so elated that with the whole uh me too and i know that some of it pisses people off when it pisses people off that pisses me off it's like are you trying to say we should just stay getting Rate and believe that work. Mm -hmm. Fuck you. For anyone that has those feelings, fuck you. You know, if it annoys you, just go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> because in the meantime, these people are trying to go to work confidently. They're trying to elevate themselves to the next level confidently. But one of the best pieces of news I ever heard that lets me know there's hope for the younger generation and the current generation is um, the gymnastics team. I don't know if you remember that, but the USA gymnastics team, when the, the doctor um, mm. for years was molesting mm. all the girls, and 23 girls. Mm. I've never heard such an, a victory. It took years to happen. Though it was only mentioned last year, he was called out years before, but the fact that his 
superiors allowed it to continue. They allowed him to keep molesting these girls and stay quiet. But then now that this movement has come out and people have had to step down, um, Harvey Weinstein, I don't think he's going to face imprisonment, but he's gone bankrupt. He's been taken down from his own brand. Mm. That, there's been progress. There's over 20 men who have been demoted and shamed and humiliated and have to pay the price in many different ways. But the gymnastics team was a victory for the young girls. They're no longer being molested. It's taken seriously now. So there has been improvements. A um, couple of thoughts that I had while you were talking. Um, so I'm not going to name the university, but I did some work recently. Um, and um, it was said beforehand that um, me and the two others involved would be getting the same. Um, one of them, the only male that was doing it, um, ended up um, accidentally sending their invoice to everyone. And I found it was double the amount that I was told. Um, so I'm still waiting to hear on that, which is why I'm not going to say any more on that. But um, very <laughs> annoying. And, um, and also with the catcalling thing, the thing that really, um, in, in terms of my experience, is that, um, that gets me, is that I ha experienced it a lot more when I was at school as a teenager, and I find that it's really disturbing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's something about school uniform that you just constantly... But constantly even not without the uniform, but the age. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not. Um, really hard to do. And now, um, any questions from the audience at all? Yep. Um, well, you can say it. <laughs> Hi. Um, kind of based on what you guys were saying, I was wondering what you were thinking about, like, poetry and writing poetry as a woman because I feel like I have been levelled with a lot of comments by men from being a woman poet. I say that with quotation marks, I don't know why, because I always feel like I have to sort of have a caveat to being a woman poet. Um, but like how it's always seen as either like too emotional, confessional, um, you know, expressing too much, not having restraint, not kind of using language in a good way, and all of, all of these kind of criticisms. Um, and it's very forward shit. And I wonder if you guys feel that, I mean, all your poems are so beautiful and wonderful, but also so kind of like deeply emotional, I felt. Um, and whether, yeah, that kind of insecurity came into your writing, or how you feel about that. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I didn't. Yeah, as a, as a poet, I'm a poet, full stop. Mm. I, you sound, I think a lot of it, it does sound a lot with your age. Yeah. Yeah, because I think that with your age group, much like when I hear Nicki Minaj, who I don't like, talk about <laughs> being a female rapper, she, she believes she's it, she believes she's the one that's pioneered for everyone. Mm and she's the only one who's ever done it. Mm. But I think because of today's date, she keeps saying, why do I have to defend myself as a female? She brings the female part too damn often. Mm. And I think in the rap world, which people think is very similar to poetry sort of, mm. I think with your generation, that's what I'm comparing it to, where, you, where it makes you hang over the fact that I'm a female, I'm different, I'm gonna be judged for this or judged for that. I care less, yeah. care less. That's one of the best mottos I've taught myself this year, which has helped me go through life much easier. I care less about what people think. They're gonna judge you anyway, that's a fact. Sure. They're gonna bring you down. You don't need to go to bed frustrated. Yeah. Careless. <laughs> yeah, I would really echo that is I mean I think it without wanting to be horribly patronizing, um, I think it is a lot about kind of experience and I uh, my biggest piece of advice would be to try not to care. I mean that's really hard. I mean I I've been told that I'm hysterical and gobby and abrasive mm. and just hard to listen to. <laughs> um, and can you slow it down a little bit? And all sorts. And, you know. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, I hope I won't offend anyone in the room, but those comments normally come from, like, older white male poets. Mm. And um, I think it's probably just because you're upsetting them a bit. So if you're upsetting yeah. them, a bit, you're probably doing the job right. <laughs> Which I, I totally agree with, but I feel like it, like, inhibits your progress like i feel like if I you like, allow it sh sure and i think that's totally right but it's like you know when you're in a world where you're like i want to make i want to i want to get in a room where i can like speak and like engage with people who listen to my poetry and like give me good advice and whatever but i feel like it's all these people being like mm, well that's a mission they're like 
uh, inflammatory think, word. Then I think then you need to think about kind of um, picking and choosing <coughs> which um, feedback and advice is helpful. Yeah. So when people offer you advice, think, is this advice that I'm going to take on board, or is it just somebody being patronising and critical? And yeah. um, I mean, it's like anything, isn't it? It's like you just, it's really shit, and it'd be really good if that sort of stuff didn't happen. Um, but, it but it does, yeah. and so the best thing you can do is just to carry on writing and performing and, and be brilliant and irritate the old one. Mm -hmm. And that, on the back of that as well, I'd say, I mean, I don't, I don't know how old you are, but I, I certainly look a lot younger than I am, and I, I very often get lumped in with kind of, uh, I mean, like when I'm playing acting and stuff like that, I'm, I'm 16 to 18 year olds all the time. It's um, very flattering, but significantly <laughs> under, <laughs> underestimating. And it, it's something I get a lot, and I, I think you probably get that as well, because you you do look quite young, and uh, and as you say, quite rightly, it, it tends to be older, um, often middle class white men who probably haven't faced quite as much um, oppression or, or kind of, you know, frustration in terms of being given a platform as, as you may have and it just scares them. It scares them that somebody who they think is, is just a little girl um, who like you know is just as good or if not better than them. Mm -hmm. And I get it a lot and I, I you will get it a lot and you just have to sort of keep going and go, actually do you know what? That's you've said more about yourself than you have about me. And if if you feel the need to come over and give me constructive criticism or feedback um, because you think <coughs> I could have done a better job than you, um, then that's actually just on you, that's on them entirely. The other thing I find that. more irritating actually than criticism is when um, men of any age um, are very kind of patronising and like, well done you! <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's true! <laughs> You should keep going. Yeah. It's very strange. It is very strange. Yes, yeah. I had to confront a guy that said that to me one time. I performed somewhere. I, I performed some place. I don't remember which one it was. I just remember performing, and um, this guy who looks decent looking in the audience. And when he came up to me, I was like, "Oh, it's you!" And I recognised your face. And then he went, "Well done." And I was like, "What the fuck you mean, well done?" <laughs> and he was my age. You know, well done. It's, why don't you just say I liked it, or that was good, or specific? It yeah. sounded like I didn't think you would do that well. <laughs> That's what it sounded like, you know. But so yeah, yeah, quite yeah. good. Yeah. But bear in yeah. mind, literally, if you take yeah. on too much of what people say, you're gonna let that stifle your stuff. And that's what I was saying about dieting. Cut that out. It's gonna give you grief anyway. Yeah. yeah. Just, just, just. There's an audience for everything. If they're not the right audience, move on to a different audience. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Mm. Thank you. On that as well, I um, had something that happened ages ago, years ago, where um, someone gave me some feedback, and um, they just said it was very feminine, and it's like they obviously meant it as a negative thing, but why? <laughs> and um, and obviously, like it stuck with me. I wrote poems about it and things like that. But um, I think for me, I tend to just embrace it. And bring, like if it's emotional, yeah. Like yeah. if it's confessional, I'm bringing it back and making it cool. Like, yeah. 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 So um, yeah, it's I, it, I do definitely think it's really hard to kind of not care, but channel the energy into something positive, I guess. And if you do care, just pretend you don't until you don't care. Because <laughs> that's hard. It's hard. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. It is very hard. Very hard. Yeah. But the more you pretend you don't care, the more you realise you really don't fucking care. Yeah. <laughs> There's only one time that I let it bother to... Because when I said no, I actually meant it, it didn't. When I started, I started as a child, I just thought, I'm a poet, we're all poets. Who's good, who's not? And a lot of people weren't, you know, good. Yeah. But we just did what we did. But however, when I did my book, I felt it then. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do a book of love poems. I thought it was so corny. Mm -hmm. I thought, for a female poet, it's not a good look. And that's what made, gave me a huge insecurity. But you know what the joke is? My biggest customers are male. <laughs> I did not see that coming. Yeah. I really didn't. My biggest customers are male. Between my cards and my books, they're the ones. Can I buy one? Today, I sold two books today. One of them, the first person was to a male. You know, so I'm just, I'm, I'm used to it now. So, yeah, yeah. but I get it. I, I felt funny. I shouldn't have, but that's been a big money maker for me. My next book is very much the opposite. And it'll be interesting to see that outlook. Just write what you want to write. 
Um, so I think we're going to have to probably wrap up quite soon, but we have a question here. Um, I was just wondering how you guys deal with like self doubt in terms of like promoting yourself, especially when poetry is such an emotional thing. It's really hard to be like, here's all my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Yeah. So like, how do you push yourself past that like self doubt and like kind of promote yourself anyway and put yourself out there? Mm. Oh, that's a hard one to unpack, isn't it? <laughs> um, I think, I think first of all, it, it definitely comes from experience. There was a time when um, I would just, I when my first book came out, I just wouldn't mention it on stage. I'd be saying, "I've got a book. You probably won't want to buy it. It's rubbish. Don't buy it. But you can't have one." Um, <laughs> and I think it just became. I so in terms of trying to sell my books, I um, now have like. I know what I'm going to say to try and persuade people to buy my book, sorry. Um, uh, and so that then I can kind of know what I'm going to say and then I won't feel embarrassed when I come to say it on stage. I think that's one thing. I think in terms of um, my own writing, I have lots of places that I go for feedback um, and I tend not to put my work out kind of really publicly until I'm really sure of what I've done and I'm sure that it is the best work that I can do um, so that I'm not going to put something out and then three weeks down the line feel horrible about it. Um, there's a lot of that. Um, and again, just trying not to care, trying not to care about just trying to be brave and trying to be confident and try and, 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 and share your work with people that you trust and people that are going to give you helpful feedback and, and those sort of things, I suppose. Cool, thank you. Um, and then if there's no more... Oh, sorry, I dominate the answer. Yes. I think we've got one more question with the same thing, so... Um, yeah, earlier you said that most of your audience were men that buy your book. Yeah. I was just wondering, on the flip side, there are men that are fetishise like strong women, mm -hmm. and men are kind of expected to be strong, and when a woman's a feminist, they're like, oh, she's a strong woman. It's like, we're not expected to be strong. So when, yeah, guys buy a book, do you not think there's an element of fetishisation going on as well? Because uh, I get approached a lot, men talk to me a lot in general. Yeah, so when they talk, I'm not being big headed at all, I'm just saying. <laughs> so I, it's a similar interaction is what I'm saying. Yeah, so when they talk to me, and even if it's off, I've picked up, picked up, I don't go home with them, but I've, I've, I've been chatted up a lot after a show, whether it's a book in sale or not, or not. And when they do, they approach you in the exact same way. I really loved your poetry, so where do you live? You know, it's like that or something. Or they just start, you know, start flirting, but I noticed that they referred to my words a lot. It stayed in their mind, so I realised they're very personality driven. I appreciate you being more into my personality and words than looks, you know. So for the most part, as long as no one's disrespectful to me, I, I take it as a compliment. I'm okay with that. I know that they have their fetishes with different things. There's a poem I have called Shoegasm. And I know that some guys are really into feet. <laughs> you know, so sometimes it could be... I know that they have their different reasons on why they want to talk to me, but for the most part, they always say, I'm curious, I just want to know more about you. They just have their own little inkling, even if it's flirtish like, and I don't mind, it's a sale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just don't disrespect me and I'm fine. I think if they're buying your book, then they're buying your book. Yeah. <laughs> and also, I think it's important not to kind of demonise um, men. <laughs> In a way, I think it can be really easily done. Um, especially at events where it's, you know, it's a feminist-driven narrative. Um, because it is hard, it is hard because a lot of the time men are the problem. Um, and a lot of the time it's because um, we let men be the problem, I think. I think there is a definite amount of, of us kind of not being prepared to, to stand up to that. But um, I think it's really important not to be like, oh, men are awful and, and if, someone, if a man likes what you've done it's because he fancies you because I think, you know, you have to also be open-minded and say actually some, some men, many men, a lot of men are not awful people and a lot of men genuinely do appreciate talent or intelligence or, or a damn good poem and I think it's really important not to, you know, let one, uh, one facet of humanity tar an entire gender, much as we don't want to be. I guess um, it's hard to to know in that context. Sometimes, I mean, you're saying that sometimes you can tell, but um, I guess a lot of the time you aren't going to really know either way. Mm -hmm. um, 
unless there, there's the line that's crossed. And so I guess for your own like mental health, it's probably good to, to try and think positively yeah. if someone's yeah. buying your stuff. I'm, I'm okay with it because they approach me in a, in a yeah. nice way. Mm. Yeah, in life, yeah. generally. I think that's what matters, that, that actual interaction. The interaction, yeah, yeah. as long as it's respectful, you know, I'm, they, they admire my work generally and I'm, I'm fine with it. Mm. Oh, just before I forget, you, um, just to add on to the point that you said, the brilliant points that you was making, there's a book called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't read it. Okay. <laughs> but the reason, why, the reason why this is good advice is because um, I keep staring at the, the book cover. And I'm very much a book chaser, so sometimes I don't have the patience to read. Yeah, so feel the fear and do it anyway is a great way to go through things is what I'm trying to say. So if you bear that in your mind, it can be very scary to promote yourself to the public. I hate social media with a passion, mm. but I have to do it. It hasn't really paid any of my bills, but it's necessary, especially for the self-promotion market. If you're self-published, you're independent, you have to put yourself out there. You just have to feel the fear and do it anyway and try to make it enjoyable for yourself. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. I've I've read that book and like I think my mum gave it to me when I was good? a teenager or something and I can't remember it much now but I think at the time it must have had an impact because that is kind of how I live my life. Good. The time. So, yeah. I'll read it eventually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I think we're probably going to get kicked out here soon. So um, a couple of things, if you have any like cups and glasses it would be great if you could put, um, bring them up and even better if you would be so kind as to stack some chairs that would be amazing as well and we can get out here a lot quicker and um, there's the mailing list and all that kind of stuff badges so on your way out um, and thanks to everyone who was in the open mind and our teachers and to all of you.